before we make a start. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar today. We are so pleased um, to have you all here with us, um, and we're glad that you could make it. It's a pleasure to bring our second webinar um, this year from the Global South Dialogue on Economic Crime, and today we'll be exploring uh, the effectiveness of whistleblowing frameworks in Africa. Um, before we commence the webinar, I'd like to share a couple of words um, on the network itself to give you an overview of what our network is about. So the Global South Economic Dialogue on Crime is a multidisciplinary network and was founded out of a lacuna of discussions and perspectives from the Global South in relation to illicit funds um, and how to combat financial crime. The consistent failure of contextualizing these challenges to prevent and combat these crimes has always come up, but there has been very little effort to collaboratively um, address these. The concept of, concept of legal transplantation of both standards and regulations without a nonced approach often left the Global South countries with very ineffective tools to meet the international standards imposed. Therefore, one of the primary purpose and objectives of this network is to seek how best we can address this lacuna. And we look at this from an academic and a practitioner perspective. The network is primarily interdisciplinary in nature and focuses on the global self knowledge of sharing for advancing dialogue, advancing research and advancing capacity on economic crimes. The primary focus is on facilitating practical and practically how we can um, provide innovative and research orientated responses to address complex economic challenges that exist within the global south. This is a new network and it is our aim to grow that network to um, help various stakeholders such as yourselves that have joined us today. We also help to um, hope to build capacity within lawmakers policymakers, enforcement officers, national and subnational governments, and different inter-government agencies. We do have an ambitious mission, and it is to project the expertise of leading stakeholders and members who are already extensively involved in combating economic crimes across the global south, and who would effectively respond to illicit crimes and give more adequate, a truly global approach to these challenges. The founding team of the network consists of Dr. Lavina Otudo from the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, Dr. Inke Chukul Azenge Igri, who's from uh, Lincoln University, Lucky Star Mianzandi, who is a tax researcher, Dr. Joy Malala from Aston University, and my humble self, Kolashadi Adiemo from the University of Reading. So we move to today's webinar. 
Whistleblowing can be utilized as a highly instrumental tool in curtailing corruption. And as we know, the act of whistleblowing is not a common practice. And this could be generally because of the absence of robust mechanisms to deal and combat uh, protection for the whistleblower. The low rate of whistleblowing may also be attributed to a number of different factors, and this include inadequate corporate governance frameworks and inadequate procedures to deal with the whistleblowing procedure as a whole. Today, we are pleased to be joined by a stellar panel of speakers who will be focusing especially on Africa, with a particular focus on four emerging economies. We will be hearing from speakers from Uganda, from Nigeria, from Kenya, and also from Uganda, yes, so from four different countries. So Ghana, I do beg your pardon. Our speakers will be sharing their findings and we'll speak for about 15 to 20 minutes thereabout. There will then be an opportunity for question and answers at the end. I must comment that this will be a recorded webinar and I am just about to press record. So just that um, we've made you aware that it will be recorded. We have our first speaker who is uh, Mr. Pius Gomezera. Um, so Pius, I will invite you in a few moments. Pius holds a Bachelor of Arts in Social Science with a first class degree from Makere University, a Master's in Science in Poverty Reduction and Development Management from the University of Birmingham. And he is currently a Commonwealth PhD scholar at the University of Birmingham. He possesses 13 years of professional level leadership in diverse portfolios. And between 2014 and 15, he was previously an assistant lecturer in the Department of Development Studies, Macquarie University. Between 2016 and December 2020, he was an associate consultant at the Uganda Management Institute. Pius has led or participated in extensive research activities for many institutions, including the University of Birmingham, MasterCard, the Government of Uganda, DFID and Oxfam, among others. He has also written quite extensively on many subjects and many of his scholarly works can be published by top journals and other reputable uh, publishers. I will now invite Pius to deliver his presentation. Hello everyone, good evening. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Thank you so much, Fora. And I'm very happy and glad to meet all the panelists and our guests who are listening to us. And um, to have this opportunity to share my experience and my academic knowledge on this subject. Like you have introduced me, I have some good years of experience in the area of corruption which is a big problem in Uganda and in the countries within the region. One of the tools that the government of Uganda has put in place to fight this problem, alongside other problems, including money laundering and other crimes, is whistleblowing. What is whistleblowing? An opportunity for people who have witnessed or understand the problem, expose it to the authorities. And to do that, they established straws, which I have highlighted. They have also put up so many other things which people can use to expose corruption. If you go to any public office in Uganda, you will find there a notes showing you which telephone number you can call to report an act of corruption. And when you go to on the roads, in offices, all police officers are required to wear a uniform that bears their name, which you can use to expose them in case they ask you for money. So those are some of the frameworks, among others, which you can use to withdraw or expose any kind of corruption. But then the question becomes, if we have all the roles, for corruption and agencies and whistleblowing where everybody knows where they can report the case of corruption. Has it worked? Has it been effective? My experience and most Ugandans experience and most uh, academic documents show that actually corruption is on the increase and it is highly entrenched. 
whether it is petty, whether it is grand, whether it is individual, or whether it is syndicated. So the question becomes, why haven't these uh, whistleblowing frameworks worked? Why are people not reporting uh, those who extort money from them? And when they report them, whenever that happens, why hasn't it been effective? So that takes us to the whole question of corruption as a practice in Uganda. You, you need to highlight or to understand that corruption in Uganda, like most other places where it is endemic, it is actually a way of doing things. So on one side, while you have people who are forcing uh, corruption in an extortional way, you also corruption that where people willingly participate. I think that will come later when I'm talking about corruption functionality. But if I can go to the question of why hasn't corruption Pius, you've gone on mute, so we can't hear you. Am I on air now? Yes, you're back. Thank you. Yes. Can I get my next slide? Thank you so much, Fora. I was saying that overall, the scoring on Whistleblowing as a mechanism to stop corruption has not been excellent. The score is average. And the question becomes, why are we not using such a mechanism where people can simply record the corrupt and it works? And why are we not achieving the best results on that? And the answers are highly summarized on that, that uh, it is not working because in reality or in real life, the risks are very high. If you are going to report people in a system that is highly corrupt with syndicated actors. You may report an officer, but the person to whom you are reporting them may be part of the syndicate. If you report um, and they can come for you, whether you are at home, whether you are at office, whether your children, so many things. So it's not a country like the United Kingdom where you know that besides reporting someone, there is an entire system that is supportive and can work to stop whatever is wrong. Here, the system is highly sophisticated in a corrupt way. So most people are reluctant. They fear for their lives. They fear for their jobs. They fear for their loved ones. So they do not cooperate. So when people, even if they report sporadically, when you tell them that it, they have to go to court and come with evidence and things like that, most people don't do it. And like I've highlighted, that leaves people who are working in the court system and the prosecutors and the judges and the magistrates without enough evidence to go ahead and punish corrupt actors. So that is one of the challenges on uh, why whistleblowing is not effective. Let me go to my next slide. So this is a continuation on why I think whistleblowing is not very much effective in Uganda. So this one says whistleblowing practices that aim to expose, shame, or humiliate actors without strong deterrent punishments are not enough. When you come to a place like Uganda, someone is going to steal a million dollars and can be punished for six months in prison. That is not a strong enough deterrent. So whether people expose, because every single day here there is a, exposure of people who have been stealing money left, right, and center, but that some have been prosecuted, others have been taken to prison, but the punishments are not so strong. So when they are not so strong, they don't feel like they don't have to do the corruption. And the people who are supposed to expose them also feel like, uh -uh, this is not good enough. So just people just move on with whatever is happening. There are instances where the government put on those things called uh, expose and humiliate and name shame, especially in the health sector. You're exposing nurses, exposing uh, doctors, stealing gloves and stealing drugs and stealing a few things in health centers. But those are people at the lower side of the corruption thing. They are petty thieves. They are stealing money in small amounts. And that's where the punishments usually take place. 
But when the bigger thieves, people who are stealing money in millions of dollars, some of them are above the law. Some of them are untouchable. So that brings in um, the question of uh, selective justice or what you call letting the big fish swim and punishing the small guys. And that has an impact on the overall fight of corruption. Why should everybody be shouting that someone stole drugs of 20 pounds when people have stolen a million dollars can just get away with it? So there's a question of syndicated corruption. Corruption where you have so many actors like I've mentioned. And these actors are everywhere. In the judiciary, in the police, in the media, in the schools, everywhere. So when you expose one, you don't know how they will get off the hook or you don't know who will come for you in terms of retaliation. So most people fear for that. When you are in Uganda, it is not a corruption of an individual. The entire system has issues and almost all sectors. So you go to health, you go to schools, you go to education, you go to land, you go everywhere. And these actors are very smart. They don't look paranoid. They smile. They are okay. They will not ask you for the money, but they will not give you the service. So you either act by giving them the money and they get away with it, or you don't get a service. You expose one person at level A, they get off the hook at level B. So that suffocates uh, the entire fight, the entire fight of exposing corruption. So, so those are some of the issues that really make fighting corruption through whistleblowing very hard. Can I go to my next slide, please? So why some people do not bother to even expose corruption? I think this is related to the point I've just explained. That uh, first of all, corruption is beneficial to most people in this country. Since the system is not effective in providing services to the general population. So giving a small bribe or small kind of corruption helps most people to access services. There is hardly any office or any public interaction that you can go or experience in Uganda without giving what they call cup of tea or lunch. So if you want to say, I will not engage in corruption, you will not get drugs at the hospital. You will not get a doctor. You will not get a, all those small services. So most people ask themselves, if I am to pay three pounds and I get a service, I am better off paying that than saying I won't pay why you will expose this person. And I can explain that with a simple example and experience where I experienced that. I had my colleagues, they were coming from the UK. They came to Uganda to do research. Conduct research in Uganda, you need permission from government, which is a simple letter authorizing you to go around and conduct research. So these professors with all their Western ideas of how things should work, traveled from the UK, came to Uganda, booked hotels, waiting for the letter before we could start our work. They went to a good hotel, three of them, slept there for two weeks waiting for the authorization letter. The letter was not coming. After two weeks, they went back to the office. They told them, your data is not available. You can wait for another two weeks. So these people were upset. They booked tickets and went back to the UK. They had not told me what was wrong. They simply said the data was not forthcoming. So for me, as a Ugandan, I knew something was wrong somewhere. If you have not provided these guys with some ranch, which is equivalent to, let's say, 30 dollars or 30 pounds, your letter will have to take a month. But if you give 30 pounds, you can get your letter next afternoon and you proceed with your work. So you have to compare the cost of not engaging in a bribe or the benefits of engaging in a short bribe and move on with it. So once you look at the corruption functionality and how most people have figured out that we are better off paying a bribe since the whole system is rotten and get on with it, or we are going to insist and expose corrupt guys in a system where they will not be punished. So all those complexities complicate the reason why most people don't go on to expose what they, whatever they think is wrong. So when you look at the, the issues of corruption on the top, not being punished, lack of services, and um, uh, 
the fueling, the, the way corruption can smoothen things, all those make the fight against corruption very hard, but also the incentive to engage in corruption very strong. So that is linked with what I said, and it is well published in a paper which is on that slide, which we went on and wrote and published. It explains all those things related with why people engage in small or petty corruption, and also why the big guys usually get away without being punished. Can I go to my next slide? So that is a very quick discussion, a quick observation on why I think there is the fight against corruption has not been effective, especially via whistleblowing. People don't want to put their own lives in trouble by just mentioning people who are engaged in corruption. Also, people know that whenever you report corruption, the punishments are not there or they will not be strong enough. So everybody simply accepts to move on with their life. So what can we do about this situation? Are we going to put up our hands and say, we give up and we live in a corrupt society? Do we give up? Do we continue fighting? Of course, the answer is that we will continue fighting. Scholars are writing. There are people who are putting up real efforts in the anti-corruption agencies, in the public, continuing to expose. But where can we win the fight against corruption using uh, whistleblowing alongside other tools to fight this vice that is eating up the real society? There are many examples. We have neighbors in our region. Rwanda has succeeded in fighting corruption successfully. The late Magufri in Tanzania had done a good job so it's not an impossible thing to end corruption or to make these tools very effective. But for us to win this battle on corruption, not only the laws, but you also need political will at the top. Political will at the top, when you look at the examples of Singapore and Brazil and Korea and all these places where it has, it has worked, it starts at the top. When you get a president locked up for corruption, then you know the system is now beginning to work. I know that can't happen here, but at least get some ministers, get people who are linked to the inner circle of the ruling elite, punish a few. If you can put it in, the, in Uganda, no minister has ever been prosecuted and convicted for engaging in corruption, despite the many scandals. If we could get one of them convicted, then the morale among the public would say, yeah, we are moving in the right direction. So like Rwanda has done, like Tanzania has done, we really need to work on that. The next recommendation is that the people who have given up, who are also part of, of corruption, because corruption in Uganda is not just a public problem. It is a societal problem. Everybody is involved. So we need to get the people on board by not engaging in corruption and also reporting corruption. By reporting, to be able to say we can get the evidence and go to court and stand by this and we prosecute corruption, that's how we can begin winning. Then also fill the corruption functionality gaps. The service delivery issue is very crucial. If there are no drugs in hospitals, the traffic officers are not doing their job, everything is not functioning, no matter how much you fight corruption. New evidence shows that when you try to fight corruption without addressing these gaps, you actually are damaging. The damage is beyond what corruption was doing. So you need to provide services to be able to improve on that problem of corruption. Most of it is the petty. So if you can provide the services, then it can be really reduced. This next point is related to the first one, punishing everybody without fear or favor. There is selective punishment in Uganda. There are those who can just not be punished. The COVID example is very evident. There's too much money that was stolen in COVID. Everybody knows it. It is well documented online but there are people who cannot be touched. Those are linked with the inner circle of the ruling elite. So if you can start with those ones, then people who are stealing $10, 20 pounds can understand and say, let us move in the same direction. There is a lot of literature on how anti-corruption agencies in Uganda are instituted, how they are not empowered and how they are not allowed to work. So the institutional multiplicity approach, where you have 10 anti-corruption agencies that don't have resources, that uh, have duplicated roles, that are conflicting in everything, then it cannot work. So as you report, who are you reporting to? Who punishes who? 
and who does what. All those issues have to be worked upon so that you all move towards the same effort at the same pace with sophisticated resources because the guys who are engaged in corruption are not the poor or the weak. They are very complicated. They understand how to go about things. So if you don't have a competent and corruption machinery in terms of rules and whistleblowing and staffing, they are not managing at the moment. So all those need to be worked upon and thank God they have been researched about. But the last and most important issue is protecting the whistleblowers. Nobody is ready to lose their life or their job because they reported another person who stole money. No, they can't do that. So if the protections are not strong, then we will continue having problems. Thank you so much for listening to me. And I hope to enjoy the rest of the discussion with you people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pius. That was a really interesting presentation. And actually, make sure I'm not on mute. Um, I have actually taken out a couple of things um, which are quite, I found quite insightful. So the idea of syndicated actors and the idea of retaliation, um, and also this idea of it coming from the top down, um, and also the protection of whistleblowers, because you know if there's selective punishment, then of course people won't want to come forward with information because one, they're not guaranteed that protection, and then number two, the person that you're whistleblowing on might not even get punished in the first place. So that's quite interesting, and I have a couple of questions, but I'll save um, until the end. Um, I should have also noted, actually, that we have a question and answer box, so if you do have any questions, please kindly post them in the box and we will get to them in the Q&A segment. So I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, um, Sheila Masinde. Sheila has over 17 years work experience in media outreach, um, governance and program management. She is currently the executive director of Transparency International Kenya, having served as a programs manager and head of programs since 2015. She joined TI Kenya in 2014 from BBC Media Action, where she was the communications and training manager. She first worked for TI Kenya in 2009 to 2012 as the Advocacy and Communications Programs Officer. TI Kenya is a not-for-profit organization and has an autonomous chapter in the TI, in TI movement, a global coalition against corruption. TI Kenya's vision is of sorry, is that of a corruption-free uh, Kenya, and it has been at the forefront of the fight against corruption and governance, reforms, supporting citizens, public institutions, and the private sector to effect transparency and accountability since 1999, and has advocately advocated, I do beg your pardon, I think I'm nervous today, which is strange, and has ad actively advocated for a whistleblower protection policy and legislative framework having initiated a draft of the whistleblower bill in 2013. So if I could please invite uh, Sheila to come up and deliver her presentation, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fola. I could not have made a better introduction of uh, the work of Transparency International, but as you have rightfully said, um, we have been involved in advocacy for certain legal reforms and among them has been uh, uh, an ad uh, advocacy and agitation for whistleblower protection, uh, legislative policy and institutional uh, framework. And that has been really one of our key points of advocacy and occupied a lot of our time for, you know, basically the last uh, decade or so. And um, we've also been trying to promote whistleblowing by citizens, encouraging them to report corruption. And just as uh, the previous speaker, Pius, has, uh, has noted, our, I think our experience in terms of whistleblowing and corruption reporting is not quite different um, from, from the experiences in Uganda. If you look at one of the reports that we have produced in the last 10 years on uh, bribery patterns in East Africa, that's the East Africa Bribery Index, you'll see that the patterns on uh, reporting of corruption are more or less the same across the, the East African continent. But I'm here to talk about uh, East Africa region, but I'm here to talk about Kenya. So allow me to jump straight, straight into the discussion on our experiences on whistleblowing in Kenya. So this discussion today actually occurs on, on, a, on a very critical day for us uh, as a country, uh, because a public officer, her name is Jennifer Wambua, lost her life in a, in a very gruesome, act of murder two weeks ago. 
she was working in, uh, in the National Land Commission. It's an independent commission uh, responsible for the you know, protection of public land in Kenya and was actually had been involved uh, a few years ago in supporting some of our work on, on school land protection. And she happened to be a key state witness in, in some of the corruption cases that are currently being prosecuted in the Kenyan courts. And actually this is suspected, of course, we, I can't say I'm 100%, but this is suspected um, as, as a key motive behind the heinous crime that, we, but that was uh, discovered uh, two weeks ago. So for us, these past two weeks have really been a moment um, for people who have been advocating for witness protection and whistleblower protection. It has really been a key moment of reflection on what can be done to further strengthen witness protection, um, including public awareness and, and also resource support, because there's a, there's a, there's a feeling that the, the witness protection, we have a witness protection agency, but there's a feeling that it's not well resourced to uh, ensure that witnesses of, of not just uh, of various crimes are protected. And related to this, of course, has been whistleblower protection, because as I speak in Kenya, we do not have a comprehensive framework in place even to ensure that brave individuals like Jennifer who risk their lives and those of their families um, enjoy robust protection from all forms of retaliation um, for, for coming forth to report corruption or bear witness to ensure that perpetrators of, of, uh, of corruption are convicted and resources that have been stolen by these perpetrators are actually recovered. So because we do not have a whistleblower protection framework, Fola, I could choose to end my presentation there but no, I won't, because I think we still have important points. On our <laughs> no, I won't stop there. I won't disappoint you. I, 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 we, I, I still think we have very important points to share on our continuing, uh, very long, sometimes very laborious, sometimes very disappointing journey uh, towards uh, having a whistleblower protection framework in the country. And I believe that this reflection that I'm sharing now can provide um, lessons on advocacy for countries which are in a similar position such as ours without a whistleblower protection uh, framework. Um, and I, I'm also keen on picking lessons from, from and best practices from those that have passed and enacted legislation and, and adopted um, policies to protect those who are coming forth to disclose information related to corrupt, illegal, uh, fraudulent or hazardous activities which act at cross purpose to the, the public interest. So even without a law, uh, and this is really what has fostered advocacy for a strong legal framework uh, for us, whistleblowing is a concept that many Kenyans understand because we have had our, our fair share of earth shaking scandals over the years and some are yet to even be resolved many years later, some as long as, as, as 45 years, you know, almost as old as our country. We are, I think we are, uh, we, we, are, we are now at, at, um, uh, at, is it 59 years or so? I think 58 years of independence. So about some, some corruption uh, scandals lasting as long as, 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 uh, as our, you know, the life of the Republic of Kenya, as we know it. So in Kenya, whistleblowers have his, historically faced retaliation, retaliation, and we have seen that through harassment, you know, dismissal from employment, some lose their jobs, and, and even threats and actual violence, such as the you know, suspected case that I've, I've just shared earlier. Reports published by TI Kenya, um, including successive bribery ind indices, have shown that Kenyans are encountering corruption, just the same case as Uganda, do not report it, and for various reasons. And one of them, one key reason, is fear of reprisal or intimidation. And you ask them, okay, so you witnessed a case of corruption. Why didn't you come forth to report? Because there are certain mechanisms that have been put in place by, um, uh, we have an independent uh, commission which is responsible for, for leading uh, work on anti-corruption. We call it the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission, and they have a system for receiving reports on corruption. As Transparency International Kenya, when we realized that big challenge on reporting of corruption, we, we have also tried to do our own part to promote reporting of corruption by citizens. We have what we call advocacy and legal advice centers uh, where Kenyans can, can walk in or they can call. We have toll-free numbers, toll-free SMS lines, uh, or even through just simply emails where they can anonymously report uh, corruption. But even despite all these mechanisms, we found that the level of reporting on corruption has remained very low. I, I, sometimes I think when we speak, especially some, uh, with, with other countries, we uh, were told that, you know, but us as Africans, we have a very 
uh, we don't have a culture of, of reporting wrongdoing, and maybe that's the reason why uh, our culture of even reporting corruption is, is quite low. Because as I, I mentioned that we have been trying to look at the patterns and trends of bribery in, in, the, in, the, in the region, and one of the patterns we look at is you know, the reporting of corruption. So for instance, in our bribery index for Kenya in, in 2019, we found that 87% of Kenyans that witness bribery in incidents will not report. You know, only 13% will come forth with reports of corruption. And 20% of these uh, say that they did report because they feared intimidation or, or reprisal. So our journey towards, uh, back to our journey on whistleblowing, uh, towards a whistleblowing protection framework. As I said, it has been long and others. Uh, if we look back to 2003, when Kenya ratified the, the United Convention on Anti-Corruption, ANCAC, um, and then in 2007, we, we ratified the African Union Convention on Preventing and Combating Corruption. And, and both of them require states to put in place uh, policies and, and, and legal mechanisms to protect whistleblowers, but Kenya has not done so to date. And uh, although there's been active advocacy for whistleblower protection, uh, which started um, and we, we started actively working on it um, about 10 years ago by even drafting a bill that was then handed over and adopted by the Office of the Attorney General. I think for us though, ANCAC uh, possibly triggered the, the enactment of other anti-corruption laws. So even though it did bath, into a whistleblower protection law. We're still, um, can I say, appreciative of, that, of the success we saw in terms of you know, bathing other anti-corruption laws because we have the Public Officers Ethics Act, um, we have the Anti-Corruption Economics Crimes Act, the, the, the Public uh, Procurement and Disposals Act, and also the Witness Protection Act in 20, uh, enacted in 2006. Um, and then of course the further ratification of the AUCPCC uh, in, in, in 2007, reinforced the need for us to strengthen anti-corruption and, and legal frameworks. And since then we saw a few more anti-corruption laws enacted, um, like the, we have the Proceeds of Crime and Anti-Money Laundering Act uh, enacted in 2009, uh, but still no whistleblower protection law. Uh, we then had an opportunity to have a new constitution uh, in 2010, which further strengthened our legal framework. And, and some of our previous anti-corruption laws were, were then revised to conform with the new constitution. And it also renewed that imperative for laws such as the access to information laws because previously we didn't have a uh, freedom of, of information law. Um, but we still have even in that gap that where we don't have a comprehensive uh, whistleblower protect, uh, protection uh, framework, we still have some aspects, small aspects of whistleblower protection, which are covered in some of our existing legislation. For instance, we have the Bribery Act, which was uh, enacted in 2016, which provides for a definition of a whistleblower. I think that was still a big success for us. And, and says that a whistleblower is a, is a person who makes a report to the, the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission or other law enforcement agencies on acts of bribery, or, or other forms of bribery. Um, it also protects whistleblowers and witnesses under the act uh, from, from any, any acts of you know, harassment or intimidation. It also proposes punishment for, for persons that, that, that punish whistleblowers. Um, we have other legislations with a bearing on whistleblower protection. Earlier, I, I talked that after the, the, the ratification of ANCAC, we had a law that was enacted which we call the Anti-Corruption and Economics Crimes Act in 2003, which provides for the protection of informers. And um, as well as public, uh, then we also have the Public Officer Ethics Act enacted in the same year, 2003, uh, but which only protects persons who are witnesses in, in the relevant cases. So in a bid to consolidate some of the anti-corruption strategies, we have um, a Department of Justice, uh, which, is, which works together with the Office of the Attorney General, which embarks on a journey to develop a national ethics and anti-corruption policy, uh, which was launched last year. Um, while this policy does not have an elaborate narration on how we can enact whistleblower protection laws or how to have a framework in place or a mechanism uh, to protect whistleblowers, um, we still have some aspects of whistleblowing which, which are captured under the at the back of the <laughs> at the back of the, of the documents, there's a logical matrix 
um, it's, it's sad that that has to come at the back, but at least there's something on whistle blue which then described um, the, uh, which is really described as a key instrument for, you know, monitoring, reporting, and evaluation uh, of the of the of the policy, and um, we have a statement that there will be the formulation of a policy and legal framework for whistleblower protection. So that is listed as one of, of course, the desired actions. Um, and so it's something that again we are, of course, clinging on to, <laughs> to to see how we can use that uh, to ensure that we we have a comprehensive framework for whistleblowing uh, whistleblowing in Kenya. Um, this this particular action in terms of formulating the policy and legal framework, you know, as we have been agitating for, is assigned to the to Kenya's Department of Justice. Although there are no timelines uh, that have been committed, um, but at least it's something that is on paper. Uh, but it's more reason why we, we, we need to push further for comprehensive whistleblower protection law. Um, discussions on whistleblowing, as much as now we're seeing the government coming up, like for instance, as I said, we, we drafted a, a bill which was initi initiated by Kenya in 2013. Uh, and when we started having the, the review meetings, the Office of the, Auditor, of the Attorney General took it up. But as much as yes, now we're having government also you know, speaking to it and that bill progressed a little and then got stuck somewhere and really which is sometimes the story of a number of, of very progressive um, bills that are developed here. Um, like for instance, the access to information law took us a whole 20 years to actually um, get enacted. We hope that it will not take another say 13 years to, 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 to have the whistleblower protection law see the light of day. It's something that we're actively working on, but this, this advocacy has largely been driven by, by civil society and so that's why it has really been on our list of priorities as TA Kenya for a very long time. And we've developed research and policy briefs on, on this issue um, as well. So we continue to engage with, with, and we continue to engage with the Department of Justice and the other government entities for some time until we saw, okay, this one is not moving, it's getting stuck. And, and now what we're doing is we're working with, um, most of you are, are aware of the African Parliamentarians Network Against Corruption. So we have a chapter in Kenya. And because we had started very early engagements on the work around whistleblowing protection um, as early as 2013, um, we were able to go back to them and pick up the discussion. And now we are trying to see an option of actually um, having it tabled as a private member's bill and basically taken up by, by one of the uh, APNAC uh, members. Of course, since then, as we, we are still pushing and we hope, honestly, I mean, I hope for life you have another webinar. By the end of the year, I'll have some positive news to report on our journey towards our law. Um, and, and so we, we, we will keep working at it and pushing really strongly and advocating for it. Um, I think since for, for a very long time, as I said, we've, we've had various reports, the task forces, like we had a big task force reviewing, very, doing a very thorough review of the legal and policy and institutional framework for fighting corruption in Kenya, which also recommended the enactment of the whistleblower uh, protection bill. Um, that was in 2015, and even later that year, we had none less than the president, you know, in one of his executive orders, uh, instruct the attorney general that uh, the whistleblower protection law must be enacted. Well, that was five years ago. <laughs> We're still hanging on to his directive, uh, but that hasn't really um, happened. So obviously now you can see a trend um, in terms of the political will to carry out um, and, and ensure that some of these laws that are really required are actually um, developed and, and, and enacted and then uh, fully enforced. I think one of the recommendations that we've also seen in successive um, reviews by ANCAC, uh, they, they've noted that there's been laxity in, in providing adequate mechanisms to protect whistleblowers. And of course, in 20, we had a review in 2015, we had another review 2017, 2018, and they all recommended that it was very urgent that we set up uh, measures to protect whistleblowers. Well, that hasn't happened, but then, then again, I don't know whether this is an experience of other countries. We've however highlighted challenges in the follow-up of some of the review, uh, in, in the follow-up of some of the, 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 the recommendations that come up of the anchor uh, uh, review processes. And um, in terms of even just collective action planning by the government to follow on actions to address some of those gaps that have been highlighted, you know, such as whistleblowing uh, protection, whistleblower uh, protection um, in, in some of those anchor um, reviews. Um, as I conclude, I basically just want to reiterate what we feel needs to be done 
moving forward in Kenya, just to have a um, whistleblowing uh, protection uh, framework in place. Obviously, what the first step is we need to enact a whistleblower protection law. As I said, we are actively working on it and working with, with progressive parliamentary caucuses, such as the African Parliamentarians Network Against Corruption in Kenya. Uh, we are also looking at having very robust whistleblower and witness protection uh, mechanisms um, instituted with very few citizens currently reporting corruption, we, we really need robust whistleblower protection mechanisms to give Kenyans, because that's, that's really the, 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 the observation, that many Kenyans don't have that confidence in reporting cases of corruption. But yet without these reports, actions against corruption, such as you know, investigations and then follow on prosecution of corruption cases, or even recovery of assets or unexplained wealth, uh, become very difficult because that evidence is, is needed. We're also pushing for enhancement of multi-sectoral and structured approach to, to whistleblowing uh, protection. Um, we are also looking, and especially with some of the experiences we've had, to, to have proper implementation of the, the Witness Protection Act and other legislation, as I've mentioned, that have a bearing on whistleblower uh, protection. And I think also a key thing for us has been um, even as we push for these laws, citizens normally help us a, a big deal in terms of pushing further and advocating further and just piling that pressure on, on the duty bearers and, and, uh, and even elected officials to enact some of these laws and ensure that a full enforcement for laws that already exist. So we're really um, upping the ante in terms of educating citizens, creating awareness on whistleblowing in order to, and also inculcate not just for you know, to pile pressure on the duty bearers, but also inculcate among Kenyans a culture of whistleblowing and reporting of corruption, um, seeing that it, for us, it's one of the most effective tools um, of fighting corruption. As part of encouraging citizens to take action, because that's another key thing. And the last thing I'll mention is, as I said, we have our advocacy and legal advice centers where we encourage citizens to report. And it's something that we will continue to build upon. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for keeping to time. I was timing. Um, so thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Um, it seems that Uganda and Kenya have similar challenges to a degree. Um, and I was quite fascinated to know that you have a whistleblower protection program, um, which I don't think from a Nigerian perspective that we have. Um, although one of our speakers, um, Ejeme is going to speak on, she may shed uh, some further light on that. So I'll leave that to her, but thank you very much uh, for that. Our next speaker is Mr. Joseph Antwi Buasiko, which I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Um, Joseph is currently working with GIZ Ghana and, has, and is an accountability advisor where he supports the implementation of activities with partners, including the Ghana Audit Service, the Internal Audit Agency, civil society organizations, and other accountable institutions in Ghana. He has also worked as a research and teaching assistant in the Department of Public Administration and Health Service Management at the University of Ghana Business School. Joseph holds a Master in Philosophy in Public Administration from the same department. His interest is mainly in the issues of accountability and has published papers on accountability institutions and how they promote public financial accountability. Some of his articles can be found in the Journal of Legislative Studies, Development in Practice, Brazilian Journal of Public Administration, and the International Journal of Public Administration. In his spare time, Joseph enjoys watching movies, playing hockey, and listening to music. Mm -hmm. If I can invite Joseph up, please, thank you. Uh, Hi, yes, um, thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, I will share my screen briefly. Yeah. We can see this now. So, uh, yes, um, thank you very much. Uh, so, just to go on quickly, uh, I'm realizing from the presentations now that um, I think so far Ghana will be having the oldest visible framework. Um, at the moment, um, since I was, um, it was enacted in 2006, um, and I realized that Uganda is 2010, and then Kenya do not have it yet. So, therefore, I think Ghana will be having the 
but I mean on whistleblowing, and people blow the whistle for different reasons. Um, so some do it just to alert the public, um, some do it just to protect the environment, others do it um, as a way of following their conscience. So people who have different reasons for blowing the whistle in Ghana and um, in other places. Uh, but just a quick one, um, the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners um, has found that about 40% of all detections of fraud around the world in organizations um, is through whistleblowing. And so to link it to Ghana's case, um, the institutions in Ghana has also found that um, Ghana loses about 3 billion US dollars to corruption every year. So just a quick assignment, uh, just a quick work. We're going to look for 40% of the 3 billion US dollars and then um, as I proceed, I mean, at the end of the conversation, I'll look for the answers and then you will see how much Ghana could save from whistleblowing if people decide to blow the whistle in Ghana. So like I said earlier on Ghana's act is um, from 2006 and is the oldest and the act is there for, to, for the public to be able to disclose information and that relates to unlawful and illegal conduct of corrupt practices also to protect against the victimization of persons who make these disclosures. And interestingly, it seems better to provide a fund for reward for people who make these disclosures, which I'll be talking about in this month as I understand. So in Ghana's case, um, the act has provided that you can blow the whistle on six key um, issues. So, so for instance, the first one you have to you have to see that somebody is um, doing something that um, is in relation to an economic crime, and in Ghana's case, the interesting thing is that you don't have to wait for the thing to happen. You can blow the whistle if you think that something is likely to happen, or it's even about to be happening, or it's, it's already happened. So in all these three instances, you can blow the whistle. You don't have to wait for the thing to happen before you go ahead to blow the whistle. So you can do it before, during, and after. And then again, if you feel somebody has not com uh, complied with the law, you're also entitled to go the whistle on that. And another one is um, if you feel there has been a miscarriage of justice, if you feel that there has been some misappropriation of um, public resources, you are also mandated by the act to go the whistle. And if you feel that the environment is being degraded, you don't have to wait, you, you have to make sure that you go the whistle on that. And you feel that the health and safety of an individual or a community is being endangered, uh, the law also mandates you as an individual to blow the whistle. Um, so who do you blow the whistle to? That's the, in Ghana's case, in Ghana's case, you can blow the whistle to the closest person that you can find, to the topmost uh, person in the country, that, that is the president. So for instance, if you see that something like that is happening, you can just blow the whistle. So you can just go to your family member, the head of the family, and you blow the whistle. This has been done in a way to make sure that an university blowing gets closer to the people. So you don't have to wait to do it um, to um, the president or a minister or the attorney general or somebody. You just have to can do it to the closest person to you. You can even walk to any church, any head of religious institution. And you can blow the whistle to their head in the institution. Mm -hmm. And like I said earlier on, this is to just make sure that um, you blow the whistle to the closest person that you can find so that you don't have to see that um, you saw something, but you didn't get anybody to blow the whistle. And then how is whistleblowing in Ghana done? So for you to blow the whistle, um, you have to do that. Mostly it is to be done in writing. But the act has catered for people who are not able to write on their own. They can just walk in and then blow the whistle in an oral form. And therefore, somebody or the person who, or the people amongst um, the list that I mentioned earlier on, they are supposed to therefore take the charge of putting the whistle blowing in, in writing. And then they are supposed to capture the name and address and of occupation of the whistle blower. They are supposed to capture the nature of the impropriety that is happening. They're supposed to capture who is committing that impropriety at the time, the place where the person, the thing is either happening, about to happen, or it's likely to happen. And if there are any witnesses 
the person they, they're supposed to catch, capture that as well. And then afterwards, um, the law has given a time frame for the person who is collecting such data to submit it to the Attorney General within seven working days. And therefore, if you get to the Attorney General, the Attorney General is supposed to complete an investigation within 60 days. So, I mean, there's a time frame for everything that is happening. One interesting thing is that if you blow the whistle um, in Ghana, the law mandates that whoever you are blowing the whistle to, to give you a receipt so that you have at least a document to show that you've blown the whistle at this point, and then you can always prove that you've blown the whistle at any point. Um, again, um, as I said, the investigation is supposed to be done in 60 days. But if you feel that the investigation is being, there is some form of information being withheld or an evidence being concealed, the law also mandates that you go to court, and then you apply to the courts for whoever is withholding such information to provide the uh, information that you need to make your case as a whistleblower. Therefore, um, after the investigation is done by the Attorney General, the Attorney General is supposed to um, get a report from whoever is doing the investigation. And then the report should tell the Attorney General how the investigations were carried out, whether the facts that they got confirm or they dispute the disclosure that you made, and then the recommendations that they make to the Attorney General to proceed with. And then even if the person is not able to complete the investigation, the law mandates that such a person still provides a report to the Attorney General, and then the report should state the reasons why they are not able to complete the investigations. So I mean, the person who is doing the investigations do not have any window to jump through. They are definitely supposed to provide a form of a report, either a report of the investigation or reports for reasons why they do not, they are not able to complete the investigation. And when the attorney general has that, what the attorney general does is that it's supposed to either accept the reports, cause for further inform, uh, investigations if he's not satisfied, or again, they can reject the reports of the investigation that, you've, um, that has been carried out. I mean, because there's a possibility that somebody may blow the pistol against a person um, who hasn't even committed anything. So the, the law caters for all of these things so that um, people do not, people are not more treated. But again, the law acknowledges that um, as a person who blows the pistol, there are a lot of things or a lot of issues that you can face. And the law has, has outlined them in the section 12 subsection two of the act, um, which includes a lot of things like you can be dismissed, you can be suspended, you can be declared redundant, you can even be denied promotion, you can be transferred against your will, you can be harassed, you can be intimidated, or um, all of this, they can combine the one to seven and then put all of them on you. So you are dismissed, you are suspended, all at the same time. So I mean, somebody for somebody who wants to build a vessel, the person is at a very huge risk. Um, um, but according to the law, and I mean, in practice, that also happens. So to get into why people may refuse to build the vessel in Ghana, there are a number of cases that um, has been reported in the, in, the, in the media and then a number of studies that have been carried out um, as to why people may refuse to build a vessel. There's a very prominent one which um, most people uh, in Ghana know about. Um, there was once a youth um, and sports minister who was um, found to have been, um, who, who I can't say found because it was alleged and then, but the chief director of the ministry and the chief accountant of the same ministry petitioned the president or they blew the visit to the president that this minister has taken about 20,000 US dollars um, for his personal gains. And then this minister was taking some monies as his per diem that were not due him. This minister was traveling outside the country. And then this minister went outside the country. He made the ministry buy tickets for himself and some girlfriends that he traveled with. The, the thing is that I'm not the one saying 
it is the chief director and the chief accountant of the state ministry who petitioned the president in such a case. And then um, they, after, after they've blown the whistle, what happened to them was that after the minister was told to resign, these two people who have also blown the whistle were also asked to proceed on leave. And then their, off their offense was that they had come to petition the president or they've come to blow the vessel to the president. So in such a case, I mean, if somebody else is sitting somewhere and then listening or reading about this, and the person also is in another ministry and sees that there's a situation like that, it is very obvious that such a person may not go ahead to blow the vessel. But I mean, these two people did not take it lightly. What they did was that they proceeded to the high court and then the court turned the decision for them to proceed on leave or to go on that short suspension. The court turned that decision for them to come back and for them to be reinstated. So, I mean, there are two sides. These two people were being intimidated or they were being victimized, but they had their, the law at, at their back and then they were able to overturn that decision. Notwithstanding, they still came out to report that even after being reinstated, they were still going through some of these victimizations in the office. People were intimidating them, they got threats upon their lives, among other things. So um, that is where the balance is here. Um, you can you'll be victimized, but you still have the law at your behind you. But what happens after the law has put, uh, protected you is another thing on its own. There are a number of examples, people who have been transferred against their will, people who have been dismissed for blowing the whistle, among other things. So, I mean, that form of victimization is one aspect. Again, there's a high perception that if people blow the whistle, there's going to be a form of inaction against them. Inaction against the people that they are blowing the whistle against. For the fear that some people are in high authority, so for instance, with this example that I gave, they, blow, they, 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 they reported or they petitioned against the minister. And you know how ministers are very powerful in our parts of the world, especially in Africa, especially in Ghana. The minister, nothing happened to the minister. The minister was just asked to um, resign, and then he did. And so far, we don't know whatever happened to that case. So the perception that even if I build a whistle against somebody, there's nothing that is going to be done against such a person. I mean, that perception is in the minds of people and this is going to affect them um, in their decision whether to blow the whistle or not. There, there is this study that was done by KPMG in, in 2020, so it's just a recent study. And then they had a survey of about 200 people um, working in different sectors of, the, of Ghana. And then they were also asking about people, the reasons why people may not blow the whistle, um, in, even if they find that, or even if they see that things are happening. And you see the 95% here is just to say that people have never reported, 95% of their respondents um, um, so that people have never reported their issues, issues that they've seen in their, and then the 43% are also saying that They've seen things happening, wrongdoings happening, but they've decided to keep mute to themselves because they don't want to go and blow the whistle. And if you, if you see on the right part, the right part is detailing out the reasons why people do not want to blow the whistle. So the deeper blue talks about the reason why employees think they do not want to blow the whistle. And if you look at the 20 percentages, the, two, the, the people are saying that they lack the trust in the system. So the system, they don't believe, they don't trust the system to protect them, even if they go ahead to blow the vessel. And then the perception that even if they blow the vessel, nothing will be done. So if you look at the 18%, they are saying that there are few incentives for them to blow the vessel on, and then among other things. So, I mean, people have different reasons why they will decide not to blow the vessel in Ghana. But, um, as I was saying earlier on, um, the law is there to protect the people. 
And even if you go through all, from all, all these forms of intimidations or hazard that I've already mentioned, the law is saying that you can still, you still have options available to you. So for instance, if you are dismissed, you are suspended, you, are, you feel you are being victimized, you have the right to report to the Commission of Human Rights and Administrative Justice in Ghana. And for them to adjudicate the issue and then to ensure that you are not subjected to all, any, all these forms of victimization. Again, you can proceed to the high courts like the others did, but they are, they are actually saying that as you proceed, you should make sure that you've, you have first reported to the commission so that the commission will try at first to adjudicate. If it's not possible, then the court will come in. And even if you don't have a lawyer, you should apply to the commission to provide you with legal assistance. So, I mean, the law is has captured almost everything to protect a whistleblower in Ghana. Again, if you feel that the life of yourself and your family is at stake, you are able to uh, petition the IGP, the Inspector General of Police, for the IGP to give you some form of police protection um, against, against you. Um, and then you are not liable to any civil um, or criminal action against you. So those are the th things there to protect you. Um, I earlier mentioned the whistleblowers fund. So many people who were saying that um, they feel that there is no form of incentive for to protect them, the whistleblowers act has provided for incentive for anybody who intends to blow the whistle. So. If you blow the whistle as a Ghanaian, and then your whistle blowing is able to lead to any recovery of any amount in Ghana or monies in Ghana, as a whistle blower, you are entitled to 10% of the amount you covered. So you blow the whistle, you get 10 million US dollars, you are entitled to 10% of that. And then you can petition the attorney general to give you that money. That your whistle blowing has linked you. And I believe many Ghanaians are not aware of this. And then therefore they feel that there's no incentive for them to blow the whistle on. But I'm saying that if you blow the whistle in Ghana, you are entitled to 10% of any amount of COVID. So like I said earlier on, um, if people in Ghana or if 40%, if this 40% as found by the Association of Ford Examiners, based on the organizations that they study, if you are applying this to Ghana's case that we lose 30 billion US dollars every year to corruption, then uh, Ghana will be saving about 1.2 billion every year if people in Ghana decide to build a whistle and decide to build a whistle in Ghana. I'm saying that blowing the whistle is one of the ways that Ghanaians will be able to help stop corruption that we are all crying about. So in conclusion, I'm going to say that as a Ghanaian or as anybody on this call, you have the right as a citizen to speak up if you feel something is not right. You have the right to speak up if you feel that somebody is breaking the law. You have the right to speak up if any of the same things that I mentioned applies to you. You have the right to speak up if you feel something is going wrong. So I'll end with this quote by the great Napoleon Bonaparte that states that the world suffers a lot, not because of the violence of bad people, but because of the silence of good people. Thank you very much. This is really insightful. Um, it's interesting that there's a whistleblower fund uh, available in Ghana. And, and I wonder perhaps that might be more of an incentive for people to actually come forward um, and blow the whistle on bad practices. Um, but it's a question that I will ask during our question and answer session. So thank you very much. Our final speaker is Dr. Ejame Ojobo. Ejame is a lecturer at the, in law um, at the Coventry University. Her research interest is centered around law and development in developing economies. 
Her PhD investigated the legal market cultural impediments to developing the SME sector in Lagos, Nigeria, and contemplated the need to reform the current approach to financing businesses. Her research raised the question as to whether this sought after development within the SME sector was hindered by access to finance, but also ancillary elements, such as the attributes of the community, the norms and the values of the individuals in the community share. Ejame is interested in social legal research and in particular the interplay between legal and social institutions and how these institutions are created. As part of her research, Ejame considers the issues such as finance, property rights, enforcement of contracts, corruption and social issues as a means of tackling corruption such as whistleblowing in developing economies. Ejame, if I can invite you to please present. Thank you. You're on mute. I always wanted to say that. <laughs> I managed to put on my camera, but not um, my speakers. So I was saying thank you, Fola, for that introduction. Um, I'll just share my slides and um, begin my presentation. Okay. So from my perspective, I am going to be considering um, whistleblowing or the effectiveness of the whistleblowing framework in Nigeria. I think some of my fellow panelists um, from Ghana and um, Uganda will just basically share the same sentiment as me where we say, well, we don't have that overarching um, whistleblowing protection law in Nigeria yet. We do not have um, a comprehensive policy. And just like Kenya, we do have fragmented pieces of legislation that do offer protection for whistleblowers in Nigeria, but that comprehensive legislation is still yet to be created in Nigeria. So for example, in terms of some of the fragmented legislation we have, I have the 1999 constitution. And if you look particularly at section nine of the constitution, you do see that the wording of the constitution actually protects of the freedom to actually impact information or to reveal information. Now, not while not quite a whistleblowing um, policy, it actually actually does embody the spirit of whistleblowing. Now, other than the 99 constitution itself, we also have the independent corrupt practices and other um, offenses um, and other offenses related act. And if you look at this um, particular statute, which basically focuses on corrupt practices in Nigeria, particularly section 64, actually provides for the protection of whistleblowers and the identity of whistleblowers. And further down in section 64, you would, you would actually see that it also protects against them um, disclosure and provides punishment for whistleblowers who basically reveal wrong information. Now this act in itself from 2000 has actually been credited to be the foundation of whistleblowing policies in Nigeria. And subsequent legislations have actually taken its cue from it. And such legislations would be the Economic and um, Financial Crimes Commission Act of 2004. And again, Section 39 actually does provide for um, the protection of whistleblowers and reiterates something along the same lines as the Independent and um, Corrupt Practices Act. Now, outside of this, again, another bit of fragmented um, legislation that looks towards the protection of whistleblower is the Freedom of Information Act. And again, in 20, Section 27, you're basically looking at the protection of, um, from, of public officers, again, even private persons who basically reveal information about public institutions. And the Act, the Freedom of Information Act, particularly Section 27, protects them from civil and criminal proceedings. Now, we've had a lot of fragmented um, legislations, like I've indicated, and there's been that urge or that push to have a comprehensive whistleblowing protection law. And in 2008, in 2011, 2015, several attempts have actually been made to create that legislation. But at some point, it only stops at the bill stage. So again, you begin to question the political will to actually create that legislation. Now, these bills actually never made it into law. But outside of that, in 2016, again, there was a set, another attempt to actually push for the protection of um, whistleblowers in Nigeria. And that's where the um, stopgap policy of 2016 came in. And we also have the wit um, whistleblowing um, and witness protection bill of 2019, which we shall be discussing um, subsequently, because this two um, pieces of um, 
this bill and this um, policy has basically renewed the drive to actually um, create a whistleblowing um, protection act in Nigeria. But before we move into considering this two bill, I think it's an interesting question to ask because we must ask ourselves whether again, a moral duty is actually enough to create or foster a whistleblowing culture anywhere and in Nigeria. And I think this particular question is important because Again, it, I think it justifies the approach in which this 2016 stopgap policy actually takes. Because if we see the whistleblower actually risks so much when they step forward, again, it was highlighted by my fellow panelists in Kenya, they risk their lives, they risk their income, their reputation, their livelihood, again, they risk their jobs. So a question we must ask ourselves is, while we may want to foster whistleblowing culture, why we may want to encourage whistleblowing culture in any society, do we only rely on the moral duty of the whistleblower to actually speak up? And that's why I ask this question. Now, again, to my mind, I think the foundation of any policy should, um, should actually allow people or give people the confidence to speak up when they um, basically with, um, witness wrongdoing. Another key foundation of any policy would actually to protect be to protect the whistleblowers from any such reprisals. And some of those reprisals we've actually seen um, on screen. Outside the protection of reprisal, we also need to, any policy we need to bring into place also needs to ensure that the acts and practices that they've spoken about um, basically that when they blow the whistle, these people that they've blown the whistle against actually come in and act, they're actually prosecuted and they're actually convicted. I think with these three steps, confidence to speak up, protection from reprisals and actual justice, whatever that justice may be, actually fosters and creates a whistleblowing culture. And you begin to see that the fight against corruption could potentially be won if these um, steps are actually put in place. And I said, this idea about moral duty not potentially being enough actually brings us to the stopgap policy which was introduced in Nigeria in 2016. And I think the policy itself was aimed at actually encouraging, encouraging the mismanagement and misappropriation of um, public funds in Nigeria. And again, it covers um, issues such as corruption, again, fraud, and things like this. Now, what the policy actually did was actually try to incentivize whistleblowing and said, well, if it ever comes to a situation where there has been, so when you produce information, it actually leads to the successful recovery of funds, then in that sense, then the whistleblower is actually entitled to a reward. So in 2016, in Nigeria, we began to see a trend of actually incentivizing whistleblowing. And this is not something that was this unique to Nigeria. Again, it's something that's practiced in the United States of America. And at least which, um, and in America, you can say they have a somewhat more progressive whistleblowing or progressive whistleblowing culture than Nigeria. So again, Again, with the stopgap policy, with the introduction, we now saw that they began to incentivize, incentivize the practice of whistleblowing. Now, in terms of when the stopgap policy was re um, introduced and the success rate, so you can, well, we can basically look at the effectiveness of the policy. Now, since the stopgap policy was introduced in Nigeria, recoveries have actually been made. So there's actually been credible tips, credible information which has been received. And so far about 7 billion Naira, which is about 13 million pounds has been recovered over $300 million. And again, 27,000 pounds as at the last updates. Now, again, since the policy came out, there's been a lot of communications, over 11,000 communications, about over a thousand tips, now, of this tips, there have been over 900 investigations, 600 of which have been com um, um, completed. There have been 12 prosecutions and only four convictions. Now, again, this information is at, as at the last update, but we can already begin to see that the conviction rates are slow. So we need to ask ourselves the question again you've completed about 600 investigations where again it's a question of whether the information itself was credible again the limited prosecution and between now between 2016 and now there's has been some low 
conviction rates. But I would say, again, in my opinion, that the stopgap policy itself has been met with some success. Now, again, this kind of covers um, what's been said in terms of the effectiveness of um, the whistleblowing policies. But outside of the success of the whistleblowing policy or this um, progressive success of the policy, there has been some drawbacks since 2016 in terms of um, reprisals towards whistleblower. And in my opinion, again, I think this is where the law needs to pick itself up and maybe readjust or reframe how it would protect whistleblowers um, from um, reprisals. So some examples I could give from Nigeria would be the case of Aliu Ibrahim. Basically, he reported um, contract fraud within um, his organization. And as at the last update, he was dismissed after reporting um, contract fraud within DLC's organization. And at the last, last update, he was still fighting for reinstatement. So again, some of the consequences of whistleblowing, which I mentioned earlier, and which some of my fellow panelists have already touched on, we can already see that being affected in the situation of um, Aliyu Ibrahim. We also have um, an honorable um, minister who was basically suspended from the House of Rep um, based when he, he blew the whistle on budget fraud within the House. And we also have the case of um, Intia Thompson. Now, Mr. Thompson himself was actually fined and um, fired for um, reporting the misappropriation of over $300,000 within his organization. And again, for Mr. Thompson's case, there was some progress in the sense that even though he was initially fired, he was later reinstated. But again, as we see the consequences of whistleblowing, while he was reinstated, he suffered a lot of victimization when he went back into the organization. It was so bad or it was on such a scale that he actually had to be transferred to another department because of the victimization he suffered when he came back into the organization. And as at the last update, the recorded update that I could find in his situation, while he's been re reinstated, he's still currently um, fighting for the arrears of his salary during the period that he was fired. So again, I think that was a period of about seven months. So with Intia Thompson, he was able to um, get reinstated, but he's still fighting for the areas of his salary, salary. So we begin to see again, the knock on effects of actually coming up to blow the whistle. And it's now a question of how do we now protect the whistleblowers from such reprisals? And I think this is where the, um, 2019 bill actually now comes in. Now the 2019 bill, whistleblowing and witness protection bill of 2019 actually now came to give effect to the stopgap policy of 2016. So remember the 2016 was simply a policy. It had no real statutory backing. And what we can see from the witness protection bill of 2019 is that it now began to give statutory effect to the fact that whistleblowers should be compensated. And again, reiterating the same things as the policy and looking at the fact that if a whistleblower, um, if a tip actually leads to the recovery of funds, if that fund is less than um, a billion Naira, then I think they get about one, um, one and a half percent. If it's more than a billion, then they get 1% of the recovered money. Again, if it's a property situation where it leads to the recovery of property, the whistleblower would get 1% of the recovered property or recovered assets. Now, again, like I said, it gives statutory back into some of the things that was brought in by the stopgap policy, but the bill itself actually now takes it a step further. Now, the bill actually now um, extends not only to the public sector because the whistleblowing stem with the stopgap policy was more targeted at misappropriation in the public sector, but extends to the private sector as well. So that's one new addition that or one new step that the um, bill brings in. Now, outside of extending it to um, the public sector. The bill also focuses on protection from reprisals and again the idea of victimization within, um, within your organization, whether it's through your employer and actually provides for the step um, um, for the protection of victims or people who suffer reprisals. I think one critique I could say about the bill is that in terms of um, 
Um, in terms of the protection of whistleblowers, one thing the bill actually doesn't cover is potentially the protection of the identity of the whistleblowers. Because if you look at the bill, the bill itself is quite detailed in the steps on how to disclose information. But the bill doesn't actually pro provide for the protection of the anonymity of the whistleblowers. Now, again, if you go back to the ICPC Act, it does pro and provide for the protection or, of the identity of the whistleblower. But this is not something that has, um, seems to have translated into the 2019 bill in that it doesn't cover for the protection of the identity of the whistleblower. Blur. And one interesting perspective would be um, that adopted by the US, um, USA, where they do provide for the anonymity of the whistleblower in that reporting could be done through um, their lawyers or things like that. So this is something perhaps a gap that the bill, the 2019 bill, could perhaps look at the protection of the um, identity of the whistleblower. Um, another thing, another critique I could offer about the 2019 bill is in terms of money recovered. Now the wording of the bill is quite clear in the sense that where there is money recovered, then you can get a percentage. Now the bill say, also uh, says, well, if no asset or money is recovered, you should be awarded based on the discretion of the um, Minister of Finance. But I think if you're trying to foster a whistleblowing culture, if you're trying to encourage a whistleblowing culture, I think more specific language or more specific terms provision is required in terms of awarding um, awarding um, whistleblowers where it does not actually lead to the recovery of funds. But again, if it's still credible information within the organization, if it's still a good disclosure, then again, if you're saying you're going to incentivize the act of whistleblowing, then this particular whistleblower is because should still get something. Now, because it hasn't led to the recovery of funds, it doesn't necessarily mean they shouldn't be entitled to something. And I think that line actually needs to be made clear. And perhaps one of the suggestions which um, some of my panelists have actually provided, um, I think it was um, a situation, it was from the panelists from Ghana saying, well, there has, there is a whistleblowing fund. Again, this is an idea perhaps that could be adopted in Nigeria or could be adopted within the bill to say, well, even where it's a situation of where um, assets haven't been recovered or funds haven't been recovered, then perhaps we can draw out something from the whistleblowing fund to keep the incentive going at um, the incentive aspect of the bill. Um, a final critique which I would offer from the whistleblower and protection bill of 2019 is that it actually punishes. Um, so, for example, if you decide to blow the whistle despite being part um, after being part of the corrupt act, it actually does not remove liability from you. And I think it's an interesting situation or it's an interesting dilemma because you may have seen some some so the person coming out in this situation may be the only one who may have access or the, a good level of detail as to the practices happening. But if you're saying, well, because you've been involved at some stage, you're not protected from liability, then again, I think it does hinder um, the level of disclosure or the level of acts or information or tips that you would receive because sometimes you find that even though you've actually played an active role you then have access to a lot more information a lot more details a lot more of who the players are but the bill actually now takes the step or takes the position of actually punishing you um, or does not remove liability from you even if you were part of this disclosure. I think in terms of the overall effectiveness, there has been some strides made within Nigeria, but definitely more can be done. And at this point, because we've gone a lot of back and forth between the 2008 bill, the 2016, 2017 bill, 2011, and now we are at the 2019 bill and it's two years later, it's still not been made law. One actually now has to question the actual political will to see um, um, a whistleblowing policy in Nigeria. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, HMN. That was very insightful. 
Okay, so we're going to move into our question and answer session. Um, Ejima, if you could please stop sharing your screen. I appreciate that we have gone over time. Um, and so one of our panelists won't be able to stay and um, for the entire period, but we will try to get through all of the questions. Um, so our first question is to Pius. Um, and the question is, you named a function of shaming. How important is shaming in relation to pecuniary punishment or imprisonment? Is shaming specific to the Ugandan culture and the society? And um, if I could ask you to unmute yourself, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fora, and thanks everybody for a very insightful discussion. It has been fantastic. And uh, direct to the question, shaming is always very bad. In our culture, if you are accused of stealing, stealing is very bad. But what I can comment and what we have been experiencing in this country is that people are becoming shameless, especially when huge money is involved. If a doctor is being bundled on a pickup and handcuffed for stealing drugs of 20, of 20 pounds, that is a very embarrassing. But if a minister or someone is involved in a scandal involving half a million pounds, I don't think people are getting that as embarrassing. So it is a mixed bag and uh, becoming complicated. So when there is too much money, people are becoming shameless. When it is very small money involving nurses and traffic officers, embarrassment. Fantastic, thank you. Okay, um, to Sheila, so I have a question for you. You note that people do not report witnessing bribery due to the fear of reprisal. Is this connected to low trust in public authorities? Further, may I ask you to reflect upon if corruption, corruption leads to low trust um, or if low trust leads to corruption? Well, it sounds like the question of the chicken and egg, which comes first. Um, I think, I believe it's cyclic. It's a, it's a, there's a cyclic effect. Um, increasing governmental corruption leads to decreasing levels of trust. And then of course, with low levels of trust comes lower levels of civilian oversight, um, feelings uh, of, of lethargy, apathy, and helplessness in holding the, the government to account. And then of course that creates limited oversight or a total lack of it. And then in this situation, then institutions run amok. And then of course, now that leads to higher levels of, of um, or, or lower levels of trust. And of, I think there's been also been various researches I've read over the years uh, demonstrating that where, the, where trust is high, crime and corruption is low and vice versa. Um, in our latest research, let me possibly get, share some statistics on, on corruption reporting. When you asked Kenyans um, who have witnessed corruption on uh, reasons why they did not report, 26% stated that they did not report because they felt no action would be taken. I think this exemplifies uh, a low level of trust. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have a question for Joseph. In your presentation, you discussed the disclosure process under the Act. How effective would you say the process is, and does this encourage people to come forth and make disclosures? Um, yes, thank you very much. Uh, um, so um, the disclosure process, uh, I think, is there is a two-way affair. Is there to protect the whistleblower? And the person to whom the or the person on the other side. So I mean, for you to come and say that I'm doing something, uh, I you have to just to protect the other person. You also have to show yourself that okay, this, this is me. I know what exactly you are doing, and then I am reporting you. So it's a it's a two way affair to protect the person on the other side and to protect the other person on the other side. So I think basically, uh, maybe we can still find a way around to balance the two. But I mean, for now, that is what we have. We have to protect both sides. Thank you very much for that. Um, we have another question, um, and this is for Pius. You mentioned that whistleblower's testimony, without whistleblower's testimony, prosecutors stand little chance of convicting corrupt officials. Is this in itself a deterrence to whistleblowing in Uganda? I think it is, because if you know that whatever you are going to do, at the end of the day, someone will get off the hook. So why would you put yourself in trouble by exposing yourself, by exposing them? You're also exposing yourself that you're against the acts. 
and then two years down the road or whatever amount of time, these people are not punished. They are in office and they come at you. So you are better off simply just leave it. Indeed. Thank you so much. Okay, we have a question. This is a familiar name. Um, and this is for Ejeme. So if you'd like to come on camera. And um, so we have two questions here. So we might take them in parts. Beyond the reward for whistleblowing and the protection by the law for the whistleblower, what is the comment on the social attitude reprisal by law enforcement towards the whistleblower? And the second part of that question is, in cases where the information is hijacked by the law officers for reward, how effective has the bill catered for this? Just taking it down. Um, I think I'll start with the second questions, which is the second quite part of the question, which is um, hijacked by law officers for the reward. Now, now that's an interesting point because um, from my reading of the bill, it doesn't actually provide for this. And this is a potential situation that could happen. Now, from the reading of the bill, you would only see that where it comes to um, disclosures and punishment for um, basically disclosing the initial information. Now, again, this could potentially, the question about hijacking could potentially be um, something that the bill, um, another gap in the bill, because I would comment on the fact that this issue was actually raised when the initial stopgap policy came out in the sense that um, when the whistleblowers was coming on and they were coming on board to claim their rewards, there were delays in actually providing the rewards to the whistleblowers and at some point the sum was so out, um, outrageous it was a large sum of money that um, law officers began to say well some this is someone who hasn't had access to this level of money before we need to basically help them manage how they would receive the money so they're not too overwhelmed by it so again potentially this is a situation that had actually arisen in Nigeria but in terms of the bill it doesn't actually cover for in that regard and I think the first part of the question was um, reprisals from the pol from police officers. And you'll find the way Nigeria works is that the police, I would say, is in on it. And in the sense that um, basically, if you have the money, if you have the connections, you can actually use the police force in Nigeria to actually intimidate people. Now, the bill is not specific in regards to um, police officers, but it is specific in regards to protection from reprisals by the employees. Now, um, if it's the employers, now, if it's now a situation of where the employer is now instigating, using the police to instigate a reprisal against the employees, then the bill actually now provides for the imprisonment and potentially a fine for the employer. And I think the term of imprisonment, if you um, um, take reprisal actions against the whistleblowers, I think about a year. But again, it doesn't specifically comment on the use of police force, the police force. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question for Joseph. How impactful would you say the whistleblower act is in Ghana? And are there specific things aside from your presentation that you think could be implemented to improve its effectiveness? Yes, um, so on the, on the impact, um, I believe that um, a lot of um, civil society organizations, a lot of development partners have taken it upon themselves to educate the people on knowing what is inside the whistleblowers act. So for instance, the perception that if I build a whistle, nothing can be done about it. I mean, the kind of protection that the people have under the whistleblowers act and then evidence of people who have gone through the process and have been able to revert decisions against them are uh, all things that um, um, shows that the, at least the, the Whistleblowers Act is making a new uh, form of impact. And then if people are able to go through the process, um, they can blow the whistle. But um, on other on the other question, um, if there is, um, uh, let me just get it. The other question was... What are there things separate from your presentation that you think could be implemented thereabouts? Yes, um, so I mean, the same question that I think the first person asked about uh, whether there is a form of an anonymous um, reporting kind of, or I mean, the, I personally, I feel the processes is a bit cumbersome, going to somebody, getting a receipt and all of that. I mean, as 
technology is coming up, as new ways are coming up, maybe we can adopt a very simple process. You can just do it virtually, still giving some of the necessary information, getting your receipts online, rather than working up to somebody's room. Go and build a research too. So basically, I think um, that's what I, I think I, I can suggest. Fantastic. So I'm conscious of time. I think we can take a couple more questions before I bring the session to an end. Um, so we have a question here from, from a familiar name. Hello, uh, Dr. Nakbodia. Um, for Joseph and Ejeme, there seems to be a lot of emphasis on monetary incentives in whistleblowing regulations across Africa. How would you rate the prospects of non-monetary incentives such as workplace promotion and recognition? Um, we can start with Joseph and then Ejima, if you'd like to comment from the Nigerian perspective, please. Yes, yeah, so on that, I believe um, every form of incentive is good for people, for them to go, come ahead and build a hustle. Um, so if it's work, uh, workplace promotion, if it's something that will add something to the person's life, um, everybody wants something good. So, I mean, if there's an incentive, whether monetary, whether um, intangible, I mean, I think people will still go ahead to do that. So, thank you. And Ejeme? Yeah. Um, while I agree with the sentiment that um, basically workplace promotion or other forms of incentives can be used, but I also kind of visualize or picture in mind that, again, if it's a workplace situation or if one example is the workplace incentive is that potentially because they have whistleblown, going back to that organization puts them at risk for victimization. And if you're potentially, if you've blown up the whistle against your boss or someone in higher management and you're going back into that organization and it's a question of you now being promoted, especially within government offices, I wonder what the level of reprisals or whether it becomes a hostile environment for the whistleblower. Because I think this now takes me back to the question of anonymity and how do you balance the whistleblower's anonymity against giving him a promotion within the organization. Definitely any form of incentive is welcome outside monetary one, but looking at that specific example, I would pause whether or not I would encourage it because of the potential reprisals they may face in the workplace already. And at this point, you're now putting them in the position that their details or their information would be revealed. Thank you very much. Um, this is for all of the panelists, but I wonder if Sheila could possibly start us off if, if she still has scope um, to do so. Um, to all of the panelists, do you think that anti-corruption fights seem to be less effective in Africa generally because people perceive collective injustice as a result of the inefficient reward and the punishment systems? Um, so I don't know, Sheila, if you're still with us, if you're able to start us off. Um, Yes, you are. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, to contribute to that conversation on whether there's inefficient reward um, in terms of promoting public good or, or anti-corruption or ethics and integrity, I, I think that first of all, um, at the point where citizens are, are activating for ethics or integrity, it shouldn't be at that point where you know, you're seeking a reward or say a monetary incentive, but really just for that patriotism. I think that should really be the driving force. And maybe it's something that even in Africa, we need to build further. But what I've also seen that it's sometimes very hard to preach patriot patriotism in some of our countries, because you say, yes, you know, do this because you love Kenya, you know, report corruption or act on corruption because of your love for Kenya. And then someone will ask you, okay, but what am I getting from this country? I'm paying so many, I mean, I'm, I'm paying um, a high amount of taxes. I'm overtaxed. Uh, I, I'm underserved in terms of even the delivery of services I'm getting from all the, the, the from the high amount of taxes I'm paying. So there's that level of patriotism that is, 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 is really not, is not seen, I think, in, I, I don't know about the other African countries, but I think that's really my observation. So I will find that people feel that they, they need to, to be a little bit more promoted or incentivized uh, to be able on, on, to, to act on any forms of corruption, crime, or, or other acts of, of wrongdoing. For me, that's the difference I see between, say, Africa and, and other countries. Because in other countries, you find that, you know, they pay their taxes and they get results 
um, you know, they have good roads and, 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 and high uh, levels of, uh, you know, in terms of education, uh, quality education, quality health services. And so for us, it's a bit hard to demonstrate, you know, what exactly is your money doing? And this is why you need to do a little bit more to protect it and prevent the loss of, of public funds. Thank you very much. Uh, if I can go to Ejama next to share some insights. Uh, I would um, basically echo the um, sentiments from the speaker from Kenya, because again, it goes back to the question, we asked the whistleblower to risk so much, and we're asking them to do that in an economy which is uncertain again when again would they get their next job the next opportunity you ask them to risk their reputation and as much as you don't want to make the act of whistleblowing based on based on the motivation to get the reward I only think morality and the incentive uh, or the will to do what is right can only get you so far in the kind of country or the kind of um, economy that we live in with so much uncertainty so much um, poverty and I think one way to kind of compensate for that would be to give not only protect them but give them a reason to speak up and it's not now I think in the long run it's something that you can take away but if you're looking at four fostering a whistleblowing culture now, creating that culture, I think justifiably incentives might be the way to go. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, Pius, please, and then we'll go to Joseph. Thank you so much, all my colleagues. I think um, whistleblowing is happening and it is working, but to make it work more effective is that whatever people are saying, can we see the action? Can we see things happening? If you come to our region, our neighbors just down south in Rwanda, they are making it happen and it has worked. In Rwanda, corruption is there, but you know the actions against it are going to be very effective. You cross the border, you come to Uganda, whether you whistleblow or whether you not, you know corruption is the way things are done. It's just the way things operate. Whether you talk or not, it will not happen. So we need to, first of all, improve the services across the board and also increase the punishment. Here, our most important thing is increase the punishment and also make the institutions work. That thank you so be, much. Okay. That's quite, that's insightful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And finally, Joseph, thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, so I think I basically agree with all the speakers, all that the speakers have said. Um, and just what Pius just completed. Um, I think the most important thing is that um, punishments against people who are found to be practicing or engaging themselves in cross practices are the reasons why in Africa, um, the anti-corruption fight has not been effective. And therefore we should encourage people, and if you're encouraging people, um, apart from the ethical issues, the moral issues, I mean, People need to survive. So I believe the, these incentives are also there to help them, I mean, to motivate them, and then to help them to go out and do their resources. So basically, um, I think that is what I will ask you for this big category. Thank you. So I'm going to abuse Chair's privilege and ask, ask one last question, um, which has just come up. Um, and the question is, I know that Dr. Adiemo is currently working on the area of unexplained wealth orders. Um, so this must be someone close to me um, and advocating for them to be implemented in Nigeria. Do you think this would help whistleblowers come forward with information if they are working for employers who have amassed wealth and assets, which does not measure to their known salaries? Um, so I guess the question is for HMM, but if we could have some insights from uh, the other jurisdictions, and this will be our final question. Thank you. I'm just having a quick look at the question. Do you think it will help us if those come? Um, potentially it could, but it's now still a question of, again, I would emphasize, how are these disclosures going to be received? Obviously, if these disclosures are anonymous, then in that sense, it's just, okay, it's an anonymous tips. And I think something like this can actually work without incentivizing them to come out. But if you're guaranteeing them anonymity in that sense, then potentially I think it would actually be an effective tool because as a Nigerian, you tend to have questions. Okay, where is this person getting his money from? And again, it's a question of this is my boss, this is this, and 
I can see his income stream and I can't explain where it's coming from. And if, if I'm able to make an anonymous disclosure, and again, my, it's guaranteed that my anonymity will be protected, then in that sense, you would find that um, the government or the, um, the relevant bodies will receive a lot of tips and information, in my opinion. And this is something that could potentially work without being incentivized to speak up. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I don't know if I can go to Sheila. I know that you have to leave. If I could twist your arm just for a few moments, um, that would be great. But if you're unable to, that's also fine. Thank you. You'll have to unmute yourself. Um, I, the question is unexplained wealth okay. orders and whether if they're introduced into uh, jurisdictions in Africa, whether that might encourage or persuade people to come forward um, and whistle blow. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, in Kenya, we're seeing um, increasingly um, a lot of work and initiatives around this area. And we've even seen some very progressive um, decisions from our courts um, where even some current uh, people who, have, who are currently um, have been charged and but their cases are not even concluded yet, uh, but where they've been unable to explain the source of, of their wealth, but are, are say are, are still are undergoing a process in court have been actually been ordered to, to, to return um, certain amounts of money and even sometimes assets uh, to the state. And we believe this is a positive outcome. And even one of the things we have been challenged even to do is even promote whistleblowing on issues around um, uh, unexplained wealth, because these reports have to come from someone, you know, like your, your neighbor and you know that this person works in a certain place and they, 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 they serve in a certain rank. But then how do you explain, you know, that big flashy car or you know that 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 big residential property and so on and and so there've been a lot of encouragement for citizens to come out and actually whistle blow on 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 um, cases of unexplained wealth but I I'm, I'm, we've progressively seen very very good outcomes coming from the courts on this matter. Fantastic, thank you so much, um, Pius, and then Joseph, please. Can you come again on the question? I was typing an answer for someone. <laughs> so the question is whether unexplained wealth orders, if they're introduced into jurisdictions in Africa, so Kenya, Uganda, Nigeria, um, and you know, just general countries in, in, in Africa, whether this might compel whistleblowers to come forward um, with information if you know if they come across this information. Hmm. That, that would be an interesting one, but uh, I think the countries differ. If you look at Uganda. And look at the political system, which is slightly different from what has been happening in Nigeria, in Ghana, in Tanzania. We have a leadership that has been in power for 35 years. That's a team of guys who came with nothing and have amassed everything. So one of the debates ongoing is that can we get back what we have lost to these people? So if you are going to bring a conversation where you say, uh -uh, how did you acquire this? Then you can be assured that even the political changes people are thinking about and democracy all that will not be happening soon so say where did you acquire this from can we take it back it would be very nice but i doubt whether the ruling elite here would even entertain that conversation great thank you so much and joseph if you could tell us um your perspective from the Ghanaian view yes and um, this is something that i completely agree and subscribe to Currently in Ghana, I think about a month ago, there was an issue where one of the presidential staffers, um, he is going through some divorce with um, his wife. And in the court um, um, situation, the, when the wife went to court, one of the things that the uh, allegations that the wife um, ascribed was that the presidential staffer, who was a young um, student who just graduated from the university, has acquired a very like vast, land, houses, cars, and all of that. So I mean, if people are able to come out in such a way, people who are very close to even people um, in power are able to come up um, in such a way to do the vessel against such people. I mean, at the end, I believe it will help um, um, Stop um, or it's it, it, it's one of the fights against corruption. Then it's, it's something that I totally subscribe to. I think it's, it's something that we should think about implementing it in Ghana to help um, stop corruption. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much. Sorry, I seem to have developed a bit of a cold. Um, okay, so I will bring the session to an end. I'd like to thank all of our panelists today um, and apologize that we have gone uh, slightly over time, um, but I think you will agree that it was actually um, very much worth it. Um, I'm just going to share my screen with you very quickly just to share what our next event is. Um, hopefully you can see this now. Um, so our next event will be a core blog post um, and webinar, and we'll be exploring tax related um, illicit financial flows. And we'll be looking at this from the Global South perspective. We also have a conference that we will be running in August, um, and we have sent out emails uh, for a call for paper and for panel um, panels, if you are interested. Um, what we'll do is we'll email everybody who has attended today just with information, and it will just be that singular email. We'll also provide information of if you would like to join the network um, and be part of what the Global South Dialogue on Economic Crime is doing. Um, and with that, I will bring the session to an end. Thank you very much to all of our panelists, and thank you very much to all of our attendees. Have a lovely afternoon.